You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Welcome to If You Know Mary, You Know Jesus. Hello there, everyone. My name is Bob Cantoni, and I'm here to bring you or to help to make Mary known and loved. This is what this show, this radio show is all about, and I'm so glad you joined me. Thank you all for joining us. And, I'm, and I hope to um, spark that, that love for Mary as um, she has sparked it for me in my heart. And uh, so it really truly is my life's work now. I've given myself totally in consecration to her immaculate heart. I belong totally to her. Every day I say, Mary, I give you my entire self, body and soul. I am all that I am and all that I have in total and complete consecration. And I pray for the grace that I take it very seriously. And I live out that consecration. That is my prayer for you all uh, that are listening. And uh, so it is really a joy for me to, and, and, I, and my hope that I can make Mary known and loved, as St. Jo- uh, Louis de Montfort says, especially in these end times. We must make Mary known and loved so that she can make Jesus known and loved. You know, so there's a lot of um, talk about or controversy with the titles co-redemptrix and mediatrix of all graces. And there's probably some confusion as to their meaning. Um, Even if we've been asked not to use those titles, that's fine. I mean, we don't need those titles. not like Mary's going to be outrageously offended or Jesus is going to be offended. However, I think there's confusion to the meaning of those titles. And and I'm going to attempt, I'm not a Latin scholar, but I'm going to attempt to bring uh, uh, the true meaning of what those titles mean. I'm hoping to do that. I, I spent a lot of time in prayer, and uh, so. But that's what this show is all about: uh, trying to uh, bring, make sense out of the titles called Redemptrix and Mediatrix of all graces. Again, we don't have to use them, but I think once we understand their true meaning, I think we need to adhere to what they actually mean and act upon their meaning, the true meaning. You see, because I think the devil wants to extinguish all devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. That's right there in Revelation 12. The huge red dragon spewed a river of water to sweep the woman away. He wants to extinguish devotion in the hearts of, the, of Mary's children. So that's why I'm, I'm going to try to uh, clarify some of this confusion so that the devil does not get an upper hand um, and, and sweep that devotion away that is so pleasing to Our Lady, but is so pleasing to Jesus, because even in his passion, um, I don't know if you've heard of B- uh, Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich in her writings. Of course, she's blessed. She's on her way to sanctity. But in her writings, even uh, uh, Jesus several times begged his apostles and disciples to go console his mother. Console my mother, he said. He had a deep concern because Blessed Catherine Emmerich Emmerich also tells us that mystically she suffered everything that Jesus suffered, all the blows. She suffered it mystically in her body. All of the spit, all of the curses, all the insults, all the blasphemies. She suffered mystically in her being. All of those horrific thoughts that Jesus suffered. Mary suffered mystically. All of those pierces, those insults that pierced the heart to the core, Mary suffered them mystically in her heart. And he was deeply concerned for his mother. And he begged his disciples, go console my mother. Because he loves his mother. Not only does he love his mother, he loves his mother excessively. How do I know that? Because Jesus died on the cross, a hideous death, butchered, shed every drop of blood. He loves us so crazy. He's so crazy in love with us. He took upon the insanity of being butchered on the cross. That's excessive love. He loves even us fallen, wretched creatures excessively. So how much more excessively should he love his mother? That's the question, but... It doesn't mean that Jesus worshipped his mother as a goddess because he, he loved her excessively. No, we're not to worship Mary. She's not God. However, if we are called to be Christ, another Christ and follow in the footsteps of Jesus, 
To be most like him, we should love his mother excessively the way he does. It's very simple. It follows, it's, it, it follows very fittingly. So if we truly want to imitate Jesus in the fullness, we should love his mother excessively and do whatever we can to console her per his request. You see? So that's uh, my attempt, and um, you know, and I'm hoping that I could uh, bring some um, some understanding of why uh, past popes like Pope John Paul II, Saint Leo the uh, Thirteenth, Saint Pius the Tenth, Pius the Twelfth, so all of these great saintly popes actually use the titles co-redemptrix and mediatrix of all graces. So, you know, it's, um, I believe it's magisterial teaching, um, not dogma. It's not dogma, but um, nevertheless, um, and, and correct me if I'm wrong. I'll be the first to admit I'm wrong. But nevertheless, these great saint, po saintly popes in the past have used those titles, and there's got to be a specific meaning um, attached to that that does not draw people to tend to worship Mary. No, we don't do that. Our Protestant brothers and sisters believe that we do, but that's simply not true. It's not true. It's actually biblical that Mary partakes in a very special way the redemptive role that Jesus has given her. In his work of redemption, he is the true redeemer, 100%, but we're all called in our capacity to partake of Jesus' work of redemption to be a participant, take a part in that, a role in that to help them save souls. That's really what the meaning of co-redemptrix means. We're working with the Redeemer to help him save souls. That's all it is. Co is in, in Latin, and again, I'm not a Latin scholar, but I know that prefix co is short for cum. Cum redemptrix means with redemptrix, with redeemer, with the redeemer, working with the redeemer, with. It simply means with. The prefix trix, co redemptrix, is just specifies whether you're masculine or feminine. That's all it does. So if you're a male and you work in a restaurant as a waiter, you're a waiter, and if you're a female working in a restaurant as a waitress, you're a waitress. That's all. So co-redemptrix. But in a sense, we're all kind of co-redeemers, if you will, working with Christ in his work of redemption. Again, we're no savior. We're not the redeemer. But God, in his great goodness, wants us to share in his divine life, to be partakers of divine nature. Part of that is work, is work of redemption, the grace of redemption. So I want, I want to make that very clear. Even St. Paul has said, I must go and save. I must go and save those who Christ called me to save. Now those might not as, be his exact words, but I know as in, in his encyclicals, he's saying that I must go and save them. Does that mean he's the, redeem, the Redeemer, the Christ? No, of course not. He's participating in a very powerful way in the work of redemption to help Christ save souls. We're all called to, in this new evangelization to do what? To bring them to the Redeemer. So we're participating in his work of redemption. We're being co-redeemers or cooperators of Christ's great grace of redemption. Cooperation. Co-redeemer. See, that's the, the real meaning which... Um, why uh, St. Pope John Paul II and St. Leo the Thirteenth, St. Pius X and the Twelfth, they all said this, they, they all looked at it um, from that perspective. But I believe that happens to be the actual meaning, you know, because I know in their hearts they're not thinking that, well, gee, you know, um, they, they, don't, they do not want to draw us to, to the worship of Mary by using those terms. So that's clear. Um, so why don't we uh, begin, uh, I have, uh, well, first of all, I'll give you the itinerary. I've got the Mary Movement of Priests. Um, I have a beautiful reading by Our Lady. She expresses uh, herself as uh, under those titles and the reasons why. And uh, some of my own meditations, and I have a document from uh, Vatican II, um, or actually Lumen Gentium. It doesn't specifically point, uh, use the terms co-redemptrix, and mediatrix of all graces, but it does have a, 
um, a statement in there that 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 actually describes the meaning of those words. You know, but it's very clear that in those documents, uh, especially Vatican II, that Jesus is the one redeemer. And we do not make Mary as a redeemer in the sense of a goddess. That's clear. You see? Very clear. And that's important to understand. And that's right and that's true. But I believe it's also um, important to um, get the proper meaning and understanding of the words co-redemptrix and mediatrix so that it diffuses and uh, dissolves any confusion of what we're talking about. Because for the very fact that the devil wants to extinguish devotion to the heart of Mary. All right? But anyways, let's, uh, let's begin our show with a prayer as always in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. Come by means of the most powerful intercession of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, your well-beloved spouse. Dear Immaculate Mother, we come before you humbly. We um, surrender all that we have, all that we are and have to your Immaculate Heart. You guide this radio show according to the way you see fit in light of the Holy Spirit. In the holy and powerful name of Jesus, I pray. St. Joseph, as terror of demons, we ask you... To be with us in a powerful way and protect us, protect this show, protect all those that are listening, be a terror of demon to chase away all of those evil spirits that want to destroy this work, that want to sweep devotion to, uh, from the, uh, of the Immaculate Heart of Mary from the hearts of all the faithful. No way, no way, in the how powerful and holy name of Jesus, we ask you to be that new Adam to put your foot down where Adam failed to shoo Satan away when he was tempting his wife with the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. No, Adam should have said, you get out of here now, Lucifer. So we're asking you to do the same thing and to protect the new Eve, the new Eve, and protect all of her children who love her dearly, who want to love her excessively the way Jesus does, in imitation of Jesus and out of pure love for our beloved Redeemer. This we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum benedicta, tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus, Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis, peccatoribus nunc et in ora mortis nostrae. Amen. So, because Jesus loved Mary excessively, He's infinite love. Um, why would any, you know, I, it's understandable because she participated in his work of redemption in the, in the utmost, the, the highest degree, in the greatest, grandiosis, if you will, capacity. Uh, you know, in ver- just, just the incarnation um, is a cooperator or a co-redemptrix fashion in the way we're interpreting that term, cooperating in the work of redemption, she participated in the greatest way where Jesus became incarnated in her womb. She said yes. She said yes. Without that yes, we would not have Jesus the Redeemer. No one can participate in the work of redemption to that degree other than Mary. So well, that's why we believe that this term co-redemptrix is very fitting in an honor out of excessive love for her and what she has done for God, for her son, and for the human race. Not only did she say yes to the all-loving heart of God, the all-merciful heart of God out of pure love for humanity, but she said yes to the incarnation of Jesus, her son, for love of humanity. That is, in the biggest way, a cooperator in the redemptive work of Christ, hence co-redemptrix. I mean, there's many other places. Um, uh, in the, she, so she, not only did she give birth to the Savior, the Redeemer, she gave birth to the church at Pentecost. So she cooperated with the Holy Spirit in the biggest way, at Pentecost, where the apostles were in the upper room, and through the Immaculate Heart of Mary, the light of God, the Holy Spirit parted 
upon the heads of the apostles, but her heart was like a prism. But the pure virginal heart of Mary was the only way that God could part, part on the tops of the head of the apostles to embolden them and at the birth of the church to go out boldly and convert 3,000. It was only through the pure and immaculate heart of Mary that he was able to do that to that degree because she participated in a degree of reciprocal love that was free and without any hesitation, without any doubts, or tainted in any way, a pure, spotless heart can only f permit the Holy Spirit to, be, to not be inhibited in any way. And so in that sense, she cooperated in the redemptive work of the church, which is the mystical body of Christ. They co-redeemer with Christ, the work of the, the mystical body of Christ, where Mary is the spotless mystical body of Christ. The church is a spotted mystical body of Christ, but what do I mean by that? Its members are imperfect, but the one member that is perfect is Mary, and she is a participant in the mystical body of Christ. She is a perfect model of the mystical body of Christ. She is the mystical body of Christ the most perfect member. So as the church, the salvation is not, is possible outside of Christ's church, his bride, his mystical body. So salvation is not possible outside of Mary, the mystical body, the perfect church, the per perfect temple of God. So that, hence the name called Redemptrix. So there's many, many others, um, many examples. Uh, it's all throughout Scripture. It's all scriptural. You can't say that, oh, the Catholics are going against Scripture. No, we're not. It's right there in Scripture, crystal clear. Mary participated in the work of redemption of Christ in the most perfect and the most exalted way. See? And that's why he loved his mother excessively, because she was willing to the bitter end to participate in his work of redemption, and especially in his passion. No one suffered to the degree that Mary suffered in unity with her son. The hearts of Jesus and Mary have been one ever since the incarnation. They have never been separated. They are one in all of their works. And everything that Jesus does, Mary, is one. You can't deny that. It can't be denied. Anything less than that is simply erroneous. So it's very fitting that all that Jesus did, Mary participated perfectly in, perfectly, without a one hesitation or stain or one flaw, nothing. The mother of God participated in the total, complete work of redemption with her son, and that hasn't ended yet. It's not ending. She's continually doing that and fulfilling her role as co-redemptrix. And she's helping us to become partakers of that role of being many kind of uh, cooperators in the work of redemption, many Christs. We're all called to become another Christ in our own capacity. So that's really, I'm, trying, I'm driving this home, that's really what it means. It doesn't mean that she's a goddess. It means, called redemptrix means that she has participated in the fullness of Christ's work here on earth, and she's participating in the fullness of his work while she's in heaven sitting next to them deep within the heart of the Trinity. He continues that work. And we know because there's many, many apparition sites where she comes as like a, a to, to bring the good news. I mean, well, Our Lady of Guadalupe, for one, she participated in Christ's redemptive role where you had nine million pagans. I mean, they were worshiping the moon and sacrificing their children. It was through the intercession and intervention of the co-redemptrix 
that millions and millions of Aztec Indians converted to the Holy Roman Catholic Church. That's why Lucifer wants to extinguish all devotion to her Immaculate Heart because she is the new evangelization, which is actually, the, she shows us how to evangelize. She is the greatest evangelist, the greatest prophetess, the greatest cooperator in the work of redemption. So if we truly want solid conversions, let's have a devotion to the sorrowful and immaculate heart of Mary who knows how to win God's children back with the sweetness of her immaculate heart. That is her role. That's why God uses her and he is glorified in her because she wins the most souls and hearts back to her son Jesus. In that sense, his passion is glorified. Mary glorified his passion by taking upon her within herself the, the fullness of the pain and suffering that he went through, and she glorifies his passion by leading souls back to his merciful heart. And now his passion and all that he suffered for these souls has not been in vain. So we imitate Our Lady in that role of co-redeeming. We imitate her, and we want to imitate her because... The, our, uh, our, our, great, our greatest role is to participate. I mean, that which we had received, the, work, the, the, salvation, uh, the grace of salvation, we are called to share that and go out to the world. Even our Protestant brothers and sisters, they go out to the world. Why? To help save souls. In that sense, you're participating and cooperating in the work of redemption. But no one does it more than Mary. It's that simple. So now that she's the mystical body of Christ, Christ and his bride is perfect, um, redemption is not outside this mystical body. It's not. It's the sacramental life, the baptism, the, the temple. But Christ wants to purify the church to make it as beautiful and spotless as his mother, who is the perfect model of what the church ought to be. That's all it is. She's the perfect member of the mystical body of Christ. Now, mediatrix, mediatrix simply means a mediator. We're all mediators in one sense or another. We're mediating between our, our fallen brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. Jesus is sending out, us out to be in between the mediator, to go out and get them and bring them to Jesus. Even the disciples, they said, hey, we have found the Messiah. Come and see. I'll show you. I'll bring you to him. Well, that's what we do. Well, that's what Mary does in the most perfect way, in the most efficacious way, in the fullest way, in the most fruitful way. No one has been brought about more fruits of redemption or the fruit of redemption has not been enacted and acted out more fully than, uh, and than in Mary. The fruits of Christ's redemption are, are magnified. My soul magnifies the Lord, the Magnificat. So Mary is the mediator between us and her son. Jesus is the mediator between his Christ, the church, and his father. Mary continues to mediate. She was the mediator between heaven and earth when she said yes and the word became flesh. Mediator. The Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament, of course, it contained the manna and, the, and the sta Aaron's staff and the, the, word, the, the Ten Commandments. But God wanted the Ark to contain these items because it, it, was, it was contained His presence. And where the cloud was over, over the ark, it signified the presence of God was within the ark. And when the cloud upped and moved, he wanted the ark with those items to be moved with it because God would not be separate from the ark. Where the ark went, that's where God went. And where God went, the ark went. Well, Mary's the ark. 
mediator, where she goes, God goes. When God sends her to all these apparition sites, Fatima, Guadalupe, La Salette, Akita, Japan, um, all these, all these, especially the approved apparition sites, well, God goes there because Mary's there. She's the ark. A great sign appeared in the heavens, a woman clothed with the sun with the moon under her feet. A great sign, not an insignificant sign. The woman clothed with the sun, Our Lady of Guadalupe especially, Revelations 12. Read it. She, you look at the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe, a perfect rendition of what's written in the book of Revelations. Our Lady of Fatima, a great sign appeared in the sky. And in, even in our, um, my scripture courses, I'm learning that signs are a way of God shocking and awing to get our attention, pointing to something. Well, when the, when at Fatima, when the sun pulsed and the miracle of the sun, it was shock and awe because he wanted to get our attention because he sent his mother to speak. And the high-ranking officials didn't listen. They didn't listen to that great sign that appeared in the sky. And that's why the church is in a mess. Why Satan is right there in the heart of the church. They didn't listen to Our Lady of Fatima. A great sign appeared in the sky. The woman clothed with the sun with the moon under her feet. So a sign is designed by God for shock and awe to get us to listen, and then he uses it as a teachable moment. What did we learn? What did we learn from Our Lady of Fatima, Our Lady of Guadalupe, Our Lady of La Salette, Our Lady of Ikita, Japan, Our Lady of Lourdes? What did we learn? What we do learn is, especially at Fatima, as Our Lady says very clearly, well, actually it was Jesus. He says, I desire souls to consecrate themselves to the immaculate heart of my mother so that she could bring them to perfect consecration to my most sacred heart. A great sign appeared in the sky. God wanted to speak. He used Our Lady in Revelations, the woman of Revelations, as that great sign. We must pay attention. We can't ignore that. Say, well, you know, that's wonderful, but, you know, I don't really need that. Um, yes, we do. Yes, we do. So, the devil wants to extinguish devotion to the sorrowful and immaculate heart of Our Lady. Jesus, throughout the whole world, is all, he even said to, um, I think he even said at Fatima, uh, don't quote me on that. But I know he says, I, I desire my children to pray my rosary. It's his rosary. And it's Our Lady's most favorite prayer. Because it's a prayer of praise. It's, it's in Scripture. You can't deny that. Hail, full of grace, the words of the Archangel Gabriel. And she says, be it done unto me according to your word. She's speaking to the angel Gabriel. Does that mean that it's Gabriel's word? Does that mean that he's God? No. She's listening to the word of the angel as an ambassador sent by God with his word. So when Mary speaks, who is highly exalted above the angels, we really need to listen and take it as God's word as Mary took the angel's word as God's word. It's so simple. It's not rocket science. And this is scriptural. Hail, full of grace. The Lord is with you. Elizabeth, the great sign, ran to Elizabeth, the mediatrix of all graces, with the Redeemer in her womb, She's cooperating in the work of redemption in the biggest way. Who am I that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Scripture speaking loud and clear how we need to love the mother, excessive, mother of Jesus excessively and, and, and see how highly exalted she is 
And Scripture and the Holy Spirit speaking through Elizabeth is giving us a sign as to how to reverence the great mother of God. Who am I that the mother of my Lord should come to me? How privileged I am. Scripture. Are we interpreting Scripture properly? The babe leapt for joy in my womb, danced with joy at the presence of Jesus. The ark came to John the Baptist as the ark came to David. And King David said, Who am I that the ark of the Lord should come to me? Scripture, speaking loud and clear, are we listening? Are we listening? This great mother of God, co-redemptrix, mediator, mediatrix. But we're all called to, in our own way to be co-redemptors, mediators, in a little way, in our own capacity. But the capacity of the mother of God far, far out exceeds all the angels and saints put together for all time. O oh, highly exalted daughter, the words of the archangel Gabriel, do we honor her as depicted the way St. Gabriel honored her? Is he worshiping her? O oh, highly exalted daughter, no. No. This is scripture. If the Archangel Gabriel honors her to that degree, well, why don't we? Who are we not to? If Jesus so deemed that his mother to be highly exalted and honored and loved excessively, and he gave us the example because he loves her excessively, then who are we not to? Do we say that we know better than Jesus? We know better than Jesus. I go directly to Jesus. Really? Really? and totally ignore this mother who gave us the Savior of the world? Really? Woe is us. Woe is us if we miss this truth as written all over Scripture. I'd like to read now um, the message from the Miriam Movement of Priests. A lady gives these beautiful words. And it's really the consecrated hearts that she's going to... Um, the devil is not going to have any effect on them. Those that are consecrated to her immaculate heart are going to experience an extraordinary form of protection. And they're going to be brought deep within the heart of the Holy Family, St. Joseph where St. Joseph is going to be the tear of demons and protector of all of those children that Revelations 12 talks about, the rest of her children, Mary, the woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, the great sign that appeared in the sky that fought with the huge red dragon. You know, Jesus destroyed the power of the evil one. But he's still out there, meaning that there's residual power. He's trying to destroy the rest of Mary's children. But Mary is going to finish him off. It's clear. That is her role. That's her role. And it's like St. Maximilian Kolbe has stated so very clearly, she desires souls who will consecrate themselves to her most sorrowful and immaculate heart so that she could make them into instruments to crush the head of Satan. Here I am, Mary. I belong totally to you. Totus to us. I repeat the words of St. John Paul too. Totus to us. Totally yours, Mary. I am at your service. My queen and my mother, whom I love excessively, I love you, Mother, excessively because Jesus loves you excessively and because I love Jesus with my whole being. I want to imitate him and be just like Jesus 
in everything, in the way he looks, the way he walks, the way he speaks, in his mercy, in his kindness, in his charity. Make me that instrument of so good a disciple, Mary, that I could be that apostle of Jesus Christ in the fullness of his age on earth because I love Jesus with my whole being and I want to imitate him in every which way and especially, especially the way he loves you, Mary. So this message is called A Torrent of Water. June 14, 1980, Feast of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And she speaks this way through locutions, through Father Golby. She says, Beloved sons, today is your feast, because it is, it is the feast of the Immaculate Heart of your Mother, your Heavenly Mother, to whom you have consecrated yourselves. Spend it in recollection, in prayer, in silence, in trust. I have now imprinted my sign on the forehead of each one of you. That would be the sign of the cross, which the sign will be signed on their forehead, and you can find that in a book of Revelations. My adversary, meaning Satan, is no longer able to do anything against those who have been signed by their Heavenly Mother. Consecrate Yourselves to the Immaculate Heart of Mary via St. Louis de Montfort. A great book called uh, 33 Days to Morning Glory by Father Gately. Go out and get one and take it to heart and do it. Because that is one of the greatest fruits of Marian consecration is that she will protect and Satan will not have any effect over you. That's why St. John Paul II says that Marian consecration is indispensable, especially in these end times. Those are words that I really took to heart, and uh, I hope you do too. It is with their sac... Uh, let me back up. My adversary is no longer able to do anything against those who have been signed by their heavenly mother. The star of the abyss will persecute my sons, and therefore they will be called to ever greater sufferings I don't really care. My job is to get the truth out there. If I'm persecuted, and so be it. If I'm to follow the martyrs, and so be it. If I'm called to suffer to get the truth out there because I love Jesus, my whole being, and I love his mother excessively, then so be it. I'd much rather Father Jesus than the whims of the world and the wisdom of men. Much, much rather than bow down to the world and Satan. I'd much rather bow down to the Queen of Heaven and the King of, King of Eternity. The Queen and the King. Those are my Queen. That's my Queen. Jesus is my King. Not these worldly men. Not the kingdoms of the world not bowing to what they want. Uh-uh. The star of the abyss will persecute my sons, and therefore they will be called to even greater sufferings. Many will have to offer even their own life. It is with their sacrifice of love and of pain that I will be able to achieve my greatest victory. I am the woman clothed with the sun. I am in the heart of the most holy trinity. Until I am acknowledged, I'm going to repeat that, until I am acknowledged, that's the purpose of this radio show, to make Mary known and loved, and another way put, to make her acknowledged. There where, there where the most holy trinity has willed me to be, meaning in the deep within the heart of the trinity, until I am acknowledged where... There where the Most Holy Trinity has willed me to be, meaning acknowledge, she, the Trinity wills Mary to be acknowledged, I will not be able to exercise my power fully. This is exactly what Lucifer wants, to extinguish devotion to the heart of Mary with an attitude that if I love her excessively and call her titles that shouldn't be called, then I'm worshiping Mary 
That's exactly the lie of Lucifer. It's not true. It's not true. And it's, the thing is, it's, being, it's effective. But it's a lie. No, Jesus wants us to honor her the way he does and love her the way he does. And he points to his mother. He sends his mother to give us um, uh, historically his, changing history, history messages. Miss, miss messages that history can go one way or the other, for better or for worse. We really need to listen. We need to acknowledge Mary. It's time for Mary to be acknowledged. Enough is enough. Mary's been stuffed in the closet long enough. It's time to let her out and let God do what he needs to do with the woman who is going to crush the head of Satan. Until I am acknowledged, there where the Most Holy Trinity has willed me to be, I will not be able to exercise my power fully in the maternal work of co-redemption and of the universal mediation of graces. <sighs> Hail, full of grace. In the mystical body of Christ, we're all members, says St. Paul. I don't know what I am. I'm praying to God he let me know. Could be possibly the feet, like an apostle. At times I could be the hand, serving the poor. It could be, I could be the voice, the tongue, preaching, like I'm doing now, or speaking. But nevertheless, we all partake of the body, and we're all parts of the body as one member or another. Christ is the head. Many great saints, I think it was St. Leo the Thirteenth. don't quote me on that, but many great saints have said that Mary makes up the neck of the body. Christ is the head to which all knowledge and graces, he's the source of knowledge, the source of graces, and they flow through the neck to the rest of the body. Mediatrix of all graces. Hail full of grace. God designed Mary and her role as the neck through which all of his graces flow to the rest of the body. Every grace that we receive come through Mary. She's not the source. Christ is the source. But she is the instrument through which Christ dispenses his graces. But the beauty is because she has never deviated from the will of God, She's always lived perfectly united to the will of God. And it, you can't say that she's separated from, her, from his will now, that she's in heaven. That has to continue. It is by her will that God dispenses his graces. He's always going to his mother. How shall we handle this sinner, mother? He's always asking his mother to, to, to judge he says, you will be sitting judging angels. So she is the mediatrix of all graces. You see? And if the devil gets his way by extinguishing devotion to her immaculate heart, by taking away the rosary, Marian consecration, where we're in fear of, well, well we don't want to get to, we don't want to overemphasize devotion to Mary and consecration because I don't want to be, I don't want to worship her. Well, that's a Protestant attitude. Forgive me, my brother Protestants and sister Protestants, but it's not true. You're believing something that is not true. It's false. Jesus is the one who highly exalted his daughter. Mary had nothing to do with it other than her cooperation. But she cooperated perfectly without any hesitation. And her will never deviated. You can't even imagine what she merited for graces because her will was so perfectly united to the will of her God and her son, Jesus, who is her God, we can't even imagine what she merited, especially what she suffered in the Passion. 
So who are we to say, I don't go to Mary? We need to say with Elizabeth, who am I that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For this reason, as the battle between me and my adversary enters its decisive phase, he tried by every means to obscure the mission of your heavenly mother. So who's behind obscuring Mary's mission? The devil, Lucifer. So any attempts to extinguish Marian devotion in any way is really coming from Lucifer. He hates Mary. And why do you suppose that? Because Mary is the one that God has given the role to crush his head, to finish him off. And why not? It was the very reason why Satan was envious, because Mary and the rest of her children, Lucifer was envious of the human race, especially Mary, because she was to the woman through which Christ would be born. Christ was not to be born of angels, as they thought, but born of a woman. Ooh, that infuriated Lucifer. And he went out on a vendetta to destroy the whole human race. And if he can destroy the woman, the new Eve, like he destroyed the old Eve, wow, he's got a big chunk of his battle won, folks. But it ain't going to happen. Because scripture is going to be fulfilled in Revelations, but the earth helped the woman. She fled into the desert. That's the hearts of her children who are consecrated to her immaculate heart. Ain't going to happen. In order to succeed in dominating the earth, that's exactly what the devil wants now, this globalization. He wants to dominate the earth. They want to control and dominate the entire earth. I can't believe it's even happening in our own time. A global church, a global uh, economy, a global government. Wow. Who's behind that? Jesus? Seriously? No, the huge red dragon is behind that. And anybody who's encouraging it is fighting with the huge red dragon. Not with a woman. In order to succeed in dominating the earth, the red dragon has set out, first of all, to persecute the woman clothed with the sun. A Lady of Guadalupe, Fatima, Revelations 12. And the serpent has spewed out a torrent of water from his mouth at the woman in order to submerge her and sweep her away. Do you see who he wants to sweep away? He's got to sweep the woman away because otherwise he will not be successful. No, she's going to crush his head. Her immaculate heart will triumph. And the biggest part, one of the biggest parts of a role is for her to crush his head. What is this flood of water, if not the ensemble of these new theological theories, modernism, modernism, the heresy of all heresies? That's the flood. Not only to sweep devotion away from the Immaculate Heart of Mary, but to sweep away the authentic magisterial teachings of the Church, the authentic Church with Christ and all of the sacraments, all of the sacramental grace, you know, he wants to sweep especially the Eucharist away. But just like he went to the woman in the old, in Adam and Eve, he went to Eve first to take her down so that he could take the man Adam down. So he saw in this day, he wants to take the new Eve, Mary, down so he can take the new Adam down, the Eucharist. You see how this is happening? But it's not going to happen. Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. But it doesn't mean the gates of hell would not attack her and try to extinguish her and do everything in its power to destroy her. But they will not prevail. 
St. Michael and his angels fought with the huge red dragon. And the huge red dragon fought back, but did not prevail. What is this flood of water, if not the ensemble of these new theological theories by which an attempt is being made to bring your heavenly mother down from that place where the most holy trinity has put her? Who are we to take Mary down from that place where the Holy Trinity has put her? Who are we? Who am I that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Not, why should I go to Mary? I go to Jesus. Really? Thus it has been possible to obscure me in the souls, in the life and in the piety of many of my children. <sighs> my goodness even to the point of denying some of those privileges with which I have been adorned by my Lord. Are we denying those privileges that Jesus has given to Mary? Are we, or are we supporting the cause of redemption? By embracing the great gift of this beautiful Queen Mother that Jesus has given us from the cross. Are we being like John? taking Mary into our own home and taking care of her and consoling her as Jesus requested, especially during his passion. Are we doing that during the passion of the church? It's going through its passion. Are we consoling her, her, her child, the church, all of her children, her daughter, the church? Are we consoling the bride of Christ? Are we consoling the mother of God, Mary, the perfect bride of Christ, the perfect mystical body, the perfect church, the bride of the Holy Spirit, the daughter of the Eternal Father, the spouse of St. Joseph. Are we letting God use Mary the way he needs to, or are we preventing him? Are we adhering and listening to the voice of the huge red dragon? who wants to take her out and prevent Christ's children to go, going to his mother. Take to flight from this great torrent of water, the wings, I'm sorry, this is Mary speaking, to take flight from this great torrent of water, the wings of a great eagle were given to the woman. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, if you ever look at the image of the Our Lady of Guadalupe, it's very interesting. And look at the actual image, and I want you to look at St. Michael beneath the moon. He's holding up the moon, and Our Lady's standing on the moon. I'm not going to get into what that means, but what I want you to do is, I believe it, it's believed to be St. Michael, but it's never been totally uh, confirmed. Um, What's the word? Totally confirmed. But if you look at the wings, I want you to notice the color of the wings. It's very interesting. Very interesting. I'm not going to tell you. I want you to go and look. The wings of a great eagle were given to the woman, and thus she was able to find a place for herself in the desert. What is this desert if not a place which is hidden without noise, set apart and arid? This place hidden and silent and made arid by so many struggles and so many wounds in which the woman now finds place for herself in the soul and in the heart of my beloved sons and all of all who have consecrated themselves to my immaculate heart. So that's you and me and anyone who has consecrated themselves to her immaculate heart. Our hearts is that arid desert where she takes refuge. Can you imagine? Because it says in Revelation 12 that the earth came to help the woman fight against the huge red dragon. Those who keep the commandments of God have been washed clean of the blood of the lamb, the rest of her children. Of course, Christ is the firstborn, and we're his brothers and sisters. Therefore, that makes Mary our mother, because Christ is our big brother. I am accomplishing the greatest prodigies in the desert in which I find myself. That's the hearts of you and I, the consecrated ones, and especially our priest sons that are consecrated to her immaculate heart. 
I carry them out in silence and hiddenness to transform the souls and the lives of those sons of mine who have entrusted themselves completely to me. Total entrustment. St. John Paul II uses that. Totus tuus. I totally entrust myself to you. St. Louis de Montfort, it is in Marian entrustment. That's consecration. She goes on to say, Thus each day I make their desert blossom with my garden, where I can still carry out my work fully, and where the Most Holy Trinity can receive perfect glory. So even though Lucifer, the huge red dragon, is trying to extinguish devotion to Mary whichever way, it ain't working. Our Lady is finding another way, and that's in the hearts of her little children who have consecrated themselves to her Immaculate Heart. So the devil can't win. You know, Our Lady in Heaven has a, has a much, much better plan. Sons, let yourselves be trans... Okay, so thus each day I make their heart the desert blossom within my garden where I can still carry out my work fully and where the most holy trinity can receive perfect glory. And that's why it is so important to do everything in and through Mary because Mary glorifies the trinity most. And when we do it in and through her, we're not gl trying to glorify him on our own wretched state by ourselves. We're, she lets us participate in her merit as our mother. If you want to glorify the Trinity most, we should try to strive to do it through the heart of your mother. And all of her merit, she makes up all that we're lacking. It's... It's crazy not to. You see? So um, no other creature has glorified her son Jesus more than Mary. But that's what we want to do, especially if we truly love Jesus. We want to do it through the heart of Mary, where God, will, the Holy Trinity, will receive most glory. Because he's not looking at us when we do it in and through her. He's looking at the beauty of her, his mother. The beauty, the moral, stunning beauty of her sacrifice and merits. Oh my goodness, we have no idea. So, finding, summing up, or finishing up, she says, Sons, let yourselves be transformed by my powerful action as mother, mediatrix of graces and co-redemptrix. Do not fear, because in the desert of your heart I, take, I have taken refuge and have set up my permanent dwelling place. Wow, I live for that. So be it, Mother. So be it, Mary. You are my heart's delight. You are my heart's delight. And my heart belongs to you, Mary. Make that happen. Live in joy and confidence because you have been marked with a seal by me and have come to form part of my property. Today I gather your little hearts into the immense, immaculate, and sorrowful heart of your Heavenly Mother who watches over you with delight and blesses you together with the Pope, the first of my beloved sons, who shed such great light upon all the church. Well, having said that, pray for our Pope, our, our bishops, our cardinal. Pray for all the priests. Our Lady loves them so. She loves them so. And pray for them. And Jesus loves them so. Pray that they can lead the church to the heart of Jesus. Because they're under attack, constantly under attack. They're, and uh, they really need our prayers, and, and we need them because they give us the sacraments. Now, I'll, fi I'll finish with this final document from Lumen Gentium. It's actually from Vatican II. And it says this. Um, it's actually from an article by John Fisher. It's, uh, you can find it on the Internet. The use of co-redemptrix as a term, while not in Lumen Gentium, is alluded to the following passage. So it's inferred in this passage. Thus Mary, a daughter of Adam, consenting to the divine word, became the mother of Jesus, the one and only mediator, embracing God's salvific will with a full heart and impeded by no sin, she devoted herself totally as a handmaid of the Lord to the person and work of her son, 
under him and with him, by the grace of Almighty God, serving the mystery of redemption. All right? So she's serving the mystery of redemption. Christ is the Redeemer. He won all that wonderful grace of redemption. Now he's asking us to go out and use it. To work at it, to, be, to be our, give it our utmost full being in the work of redemption. So it goes on to say, this uh, Lumen Gentium, Rightly, therefore, the Holy Father sees her as used by God, not merely in a passive way, but as freely cooperating. So hence the word co-redemptrix, cooperating, freely cooperating in the work of human salvation through faith and obedience. For as St. Irenaeus says, great St. Irenaeus, she, being obedient, became the cause of salvation for herself and for the whole human race. Co-redemptrix, mediatrix of all graces. Thank you, Jesus. We praise you, Lord. I cannot thank you enough, Father God, Son, and Holy Spirit, for giving us so good a mother who does nothing more, nothing else but bring us to the perfect consecration, perfect devotion, and perfect love for your Son, Jesus, the heart of Jesus. We love the sacred heart of Jesus. And I attribute my growth in love for the heart of Jesus because of Mary. To Mary. So we thank you, God, and I thank all of you listening. Please pray um, for all of us seminarians as well. Pray for the church. Pray for our governmental leaders. Pray for the whole human race. Because God wants to save us all. Mary wants to save us all. Not that she's the Redeemer, but I guarantee you, if you ask her, I want to save them all, she would say, I want to save them all, and I'm going to use the grace that my Son has won for us on the cross. I'll leave you with that. May God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless all of you, your families, your loved ones, abundantly through the hearts of Jesus, Mary, and St. Joseph. God bless everyone. Hello, God's Beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.